The two chapters, chapters 19 and 20 of the book of Exodus in the Bible, they tell the true story of the Israelites, the people of God, meeting God personally at a mountain called Mount Sinai. When they meet God, it is very much like God is proposing marriage to an entire people. Um, In fact, God refers to his relationship with the people of Israel in the wilderness in the prophet Hosea as if he took his uh, romantic loved one out into the wilderness and had her all to himself. When they meet God, now God has already, 400 years earlier, called their ancestor Abraham. And now God has rescued them from slavery, separating them from Egyptian culture and sin practices. God showed them his power for them when he pushed the Red Sea back into walls and made a hallway between the walls, the walls of water for the people to walk through and then collapsed the sea back onto the enemy army that was chasing them. Then when they were hungry and thirsty in the desert, God teaches them not to complain but to trust him. Now in their journey they reach a mountain. Moses gives goes up on the mountain. The people stay down at the bottom around the fringe of the mountain. The mountain is shaking. Then there's thunder and lightning. There's a piercing trumpet sound that gets louder and louder and louder. And then eventually they hear the voice of God himself, all the people that are gathered around the mountain. And God asks them for a committed relationship with them. Very much like a marriage ceremony of promises and vows. But before we compare this to marriage, let's look again, remember again what biblical marriage is like, what the the pure idea, what God's intention is for biblical marriage. In the picture of biblical marriage, uh, a man and a woman are living in separate households. They're living with their parents. And then they're asked at the time of being joined in a wedding, in a holy marriage, to leave the previous households and become a new people, a new social unit, cling to each other now, not to their parents. Leave the previous social identity and come and be inside this marriage made by God with vows in the presence of God and before the people. So they, they also make promises to each other that structure and present for the future an exclusive, intimate, and committed relationship with each other and with each other only, as long as they both shall live. So now we think of marriage as the committed relationship between equals, but this marriage ceremony is at Mount Sinai is not between equals. So it's very unlike so-called normal marriage in that light, in that sense. It's between a people and God. What is a marriage like between a group of human beings and their creator? The one who spoke galaxies into existence and created them. How do you and I, we, the church, How do we have an intimate relationship like like marriage to Almighty God? First, we see in this story at Mount Sinai, this true story, this history, that God claimed them as his treasured possession. God claimed them as his treasured possession. Listen to Exodus chapter 19 verses 1 through 8. Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 through 8. On the third new moon, the third month, after the Israelites had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They had journeyed from Rephidim, entered the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. 
The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people, tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So God says to Moses up on the mountain, go tell the people, you've seen what I did. Now, they didn't see God directly, but they saw this powerful action he did, opening up the sea, the people walk through, the sea closes back on the enemy army that's trying to destroy them. They've seen God, the rescuing act, the mighty rescuing miracle of God. And now they know, not because of anything they deserved, but they know that a mighty God has, has saved them. This grace of God choosing them and rescuing them and bringing them out there into the desert. It's like uh, to God here in his own voice is like a hero that rescues, you know, I hate to say these cliche words, rescues a damsel in distress. <laughs> God, the warrior God, rescues a people about, about to be destroyed on the edge of the Red Sea. He opens it up, he does a miracle, and he rescues them, he saves them, and now he says, I bore you on eagle's wings, and you've seen what I did. I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. And brought you to myself. Do you hear the, the voice of the God who wants an intimate relationship with his people? I rescued you, and I brought you out here to myself. Hallelujah. And he says, I brought you out here to be my treasured possession. God looks at us as if we're a splendid chest of rubies and diamonds. And we're the treasured possession of God. Imagine that. God, as he's, he's already been claiming his people and developing them, but here at this huge moment in the developing relationship between God and his people. He's expressing, you are my treasured possession. This, this same God loves us so much that later he came to live with us. Later he came to be one of us. Later he came as Emmanuel, God or Yahweh with us. This very same God came here, Jesus, and he came to rescue us from our universal slavery to sin. Jesus, our Lord, treasures us as his treasured possession so much that he decided to experience an excruciating human execution and die on our behalf in order to rescue us from our own sin and claim us for himself as his treasured possession. So number one in thinking about how we can possibly be married in some sense to Almighty God, the first thing is God, from his side, he claims us as his treasured possession. He has his in attention on us. He has his love, his desire, his focus is directed toward you and me. We are his people whom he deeply treasures. Amen? Hallelujah. Can, can I hear the church say hallelujah? Hallelujah. We are the treasured possession of God. Secondly, in this great ceremony, the king meets us face to face. The king meets us face to face. 
In biblical marriage, as I was explaining, the two that are going to get married, they may have met each other. But now, in the moment of the wedding ceremony uh, afterwards, they have a full meeting, a full intimacy in marriage, in the marriage bed after the ceremony. And it says here, you, God says, you saw what I did, now I want you to meet me. <laughs> Let's look at Exodus chapter 19, verse 9. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud in order that the people may hear when I speak with you and so trust you ever after. Now I said the king meets us face to face. And that's not exactly right. They don't see the face of God, but they hear the voice of God and they experience the tremendous physical effects of the presence of God on that mountain. Thunder, lightning, a trumpet that grows in intensity and power. Verses 16 to 25, On the morning of the third day there was thunder and lightning, as well as a thick cloud on the mountain, and a blast of a trumpet so loud that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. How about that? <laughs> Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. They took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended upon it in fire. The smoke went up like the, mount, the smoke of a kiln while the whole mountain shook violently. As the, at the, as the blast of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses would speak and God would answer him in thunder. When the Lord descended upon Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, the Lord summoned Moses to the top and Moses went up. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people not to break through to the Lord to look, otherwise many of them will perish. So they meet God. They hear the voice of God. God warns them that I'm a holy God, powerful, and they see and feel that exhibited. And you say, well, we don't have anything like that kind of relationship with God. We haven't seen or experienced God like that. The key thing here is that God wants to meet them. And that God is a holy God and that can't be done in just any kind of way. Do you know that we met God face to face in Jesus Christ our Lord? When he first met Nathaniel, he said to Nathaniel, I saw you when you were under the fig tree. Nathaniel said, my Lord and my God. When he first, one of the early times when he met Peter, James, and John, and he asked, follow me, and they left their vocation, their homes. They probably had to go back and explain things to their families later. They left it all and just followed him. One of my favorite Bible stories, one time he stopped a storm. You guys have seen big storms around here. One time he stopped a storm, and after he stopped the storm and the water was calm, You'd think the disciples were terrified because of the storm. That's not what terrified them. The storm scared them. But then when Jesus stopped the storm, then they looked at Jesus and they were terrified. Wouldn't you be a little bit afraid of somebody who could stop a storm? <laughs> a hurricane's coming at you and the person speaks and it stops. Wouldn't you look at that person a little bit differently? We, my friends, brothers and sisters, we met God face to face in Jesus Christ. I love, we, Peter, James and John saw him in his glory up on top of the mountain, the Mount of Transfiguration. I love in C.S. Lewis's children's stories which are far more than just children's stories. In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, when they're going to meet the lion for the first time, Aslan, who is a figure for Jesus Christ. And one of the girls in the family says, I think it's Lucy, she says, um, she says to the beaver who's already met Aslan the lion, she says, is he nice? Is he safe? And the beaver says, oh no, daughter of Eve, he's not safe. But he's good. He's not safe. 
but he's good. The almighty king of the universe, would he be safe and nice? He can just put in your pocket like a Hallmark card? No, he's God, for goodness sake. He's not safe, daughter of Eve, but he's good. We are part of the people of God, the invisible church. If you as an individual, you're part of the people of God if you've met Jesus as your personal Savior and Lord. If you've, if you've acknowledged that you're sinful and lost without Him, and then you've you, you see and believe that He came and He died for you to rescue you from your sins, and then if you invite Him in as your Savior and Lord to cleanse you from your sins and, and, and to justify you in the sight of the Father, and you invite Him to be your Lord, then you've met Him and you're part of the people of God. We have met God, in a, in a manner of speaking, face to face. We're in this deep, intimate relationship with God, and that makes us the people of God. Amen? The King meets us face to face. But have you met Jesus? Have you agreed with him about all that? Have you, as an individual, invited him into this, into your heart and life to be your Lord? Thirdly, in this marriage between the people of God and the king, by the way, it's hard for us to think about a king, isn't it? We're... We're people who live in a democracy, for goodness sake. We have our rights. You know? But that's, that's, that's absurd talk when you're talking about a marriage with a king. <laughs> the king of the universe. Not just any human king, a fallen, a mean, sinful king. But a king is all goodness and glory and majesty and tenderness and mercy. A king is, whose goodness is way beyond anything we can imagine. There's no talk of rights. This isn't in democracy. It's a marriage to the all-powerful, all-loving, all-holy, all-tender, all-merciful one. So as in a marriage, the king asks us to commit to him only. And, and then this marriage... Maybe the marriage analogy breaks down. Then the king asks us to reflect his light to others. In chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, he says, Therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. They hadn't yet instituted priests in the people of Israel, but they knew what priests were from the peoples around them. Priests present God to people in, in, in ceremonies. God wants the, the entire people to be his priests, reflecting him to the people around. But the king asks us to commit to him and to him only. Chapter 20. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Out of the house of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. This marriage to God is, 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 is a marriage to the one who is holy and righteous and just and he treasures us so much that he's not willing to share us with rivals. Amen? <laughs> Worship the Lord your God only and only him. And don't make depictions or representations of him so you come up with your own false ways of worshiping. Idols. Don't even make depictions of him but worship the mysterious one himself. Don't mess with his name. Listen to all the times through the week you hear people use the word, the word God. Even Christians. It's as if they don't even have a relationship with God. Oh my God. 
I personally feel that's really almost blasphemy. It's a very common expression. If we have a relationship with the living God, let's keep his name sacred for use in worshiping and praying to him and actually talking truly about him. Amen? If you're married to someone you love, would you just say anything about them to someone else? Would you leave, use their name flippantly in a way that just has nothing to do with them and your marriage to them? How much more your relationship to the Almighty God? He says, we're in this thing, in this deep, intimate relationship. Keep my name reserved for actually praying to me or really, truly talking about me. He asked them to make that promise to commit to him only, not, not worship other things. Finally, all these Ten Commandments, they're laws, they're, they're helpful laws for how we behave. They're true and deep. But I want to emphasize the part they play in creating a people of God. What was his purpose when he had that promised relationship with Abraham back there? I want to make you and your descendants, Abraham, a blessing to other peoples. And now he's all about that too. In this marriage ceremony with God, when he gives the Ten Commandments, these commandments are so these folks will be transformed, will reflect more the nature of God. Honor your parents. Don't murder. Live as faithful marriage partners. Don't sleep around. Don't steal, but honor others and what belongs to them. Don't give false testimony and lie, but be a person who speaks truth. Don't covet and lust after what other people have. Be more like your maker. Reflect him. So you can be a light to the Gentiles as we read. God, in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6, he says... It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. That's what God's about with us. That's the reason to change and become more and more like Jesus and to obey, to enter into this marriage covenant with God and allow our promises to transform us by the power of the Holy Spirit is so that we will reflect God's light to others in love. Amen? So the mirror of ref that will reflect God's light will be cleaned and we can reflect His light better. So we can reflect more of what He's like more accurately. That's why we change. That's why we've made these promises that God's asked us to make these promises. To shape us as a people of God who reflect the love and the mercy and the power and the holiness of God to others. Amen? Lord Jesus, we thank you that you, out of your great mercy to us, did what we could not do. You, you rescued us from our slavery to sin. You died on the cross for our sin. And in you, we are in this new covenant, this new promise-based relationship with, with, with the Father. Because of what you have done in your great love for us, we love you, we praise you, we receive you, we make promises to you. We vow to obey you and follow you and to reflect you to others. Help us be the people of God, Lord Jesus through the power of your Holy Spirit. In your name we pray. Amen.